double check and make sure the audio is getting recorded. Okay, it is. Excellent. All right, well, welcome to CISP 363. You know, I see mostly familiar faces, except for one person, you know, who might be new. Is that right? Yeah. Are you, have you taken classes from me? Um, I'm in your uh, uh, screens and chargers class. Oh, right now? Okay. So not, not too new. New. <laughs> new, but not too new. Okay, excellent. So, um, I'm gonna turn on the mic, you know, you guys can let me know whether you like it or not. We can turn it off if it's not uh, working out. Okay. <laughs> Somebody crank, cranked up the, uh, the gain all the way. I was taught by one of my students, you know, to test these things. You can use C, you know, like C, 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 you know, apparently the, the S sound um, can really test whether the gain is at the proper level or not. Siblings. Hmm? Siblings. Okay. Those words you learned in uh, audio to, to, uh, to set up the gain. Okay, cool. So is this level about right? Okay. Sure. Not too loud, not too soft. Okay, very good. Um, the screen recorder is on, okay, so it is everything is getting recorded. Everything that you see on the projector is getting recorded. All right, so we got two people who are kind of new, um, but the rest, you know, have taken CISP 362 at one point or another, um, and it's still pretty much the same. You know, I have not really changed the content of 362, so it doesn't really matter when you took uh, CISP 362. The rest, I'm assuming that you have taken a, a Java class or object-oriented programming class? Yeah. Okay, cool, cool. And what about you, sir? That's great. Um, have you taken a class in object-oriented programming, like Java or C++? Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's really just what I want to make sure is, you know, people have some understanding of either 362 topics of how to do app inventor programming or, you know, have some experience with C++ slash Java programming. So having some background in either one would definitely be helpful. Doesn't have to be both, okay? All right. All right, so the first thing first, um, I do not use, well, not yet, uh, Canvas. <clears throat> I'm still using Moodle. I try to convert over this semester and uh, it, it's a big task. Let's just say it's a really big task because a lot of the content that I've prepared in Moodle does not transfer directly into Canvas. All the equations doesn't work. All the source code <laughs> listing does not work, okay? And those are most of the things that I do. <laughs> so it doesn't really transfer that easily over. I have to retype a lot of my notes and whatnot. Um, in fact, you know, what you will be seeing throughout this semester are all new content, okay? It doesn't make sense to use you know, the old content because you know, uh, Android Studio was just in alpha stage when I last taught this class three years ago. So it's all new now, okay? You know, it's, it's, in fact, it's Android Studio 2.2 at this point, so you know, Android Studio has come a long way. Okay, so first and first, um, in order to access the class material for this class, you go to moodle.philosophios.edu. Okay, once you get there, you can sign in using your W plus seven digit student ID and your usual password of signing in into Canvas, D2L, apps.losrios.edu, and so on. Okay, so same password, the authentication for signing into Moodle as everything else in the district. Uh, second thing is you can go to youtube.com slash some profs. This is where you will find the video recording of my classes. It's not just my classes. There are a few other uh, professors using uh, this particular YouTube site to record and put up their content. Um, but I put up every single one of my um, uh, video recording for my classes. So if you want to review you know, what I talk about in class, you know, that's the place to go. Okay, you do not need to sign up for a Gmail account or any uh, YouTube account. You just go there and the content is there already. It's in public. Okay. Are there any questions about these two resources? Because you know, uh, these two are the most important ones that you might, you might want to write down because you know, once you get to these two resources, you can get the rest. Is that okay? All right, cool. <clears throat> 
So I'm going to get back to Moodle. Okay, you, know, you may not see exactly the same thing as I do because you know, when you sign in as a student, your screen will look a little bit different. Um, especially, you know, some of the topics may be quote unquote locked out. Okay, that's because you have to deal with this uh, syllabus acknowledgement first, which is nothing more than um, a really, really, really long syllabus that um, I was required to write, you know, in this kind of detail at this point. So if you go down, you know, just you know, make sure that you answer each of these questions correctly. I'll show you one example, okay? Right here, okay? I understand the REC, RSI, and communication policies of this class. As opposed to, I do not understand or agree with this policy. Please drop me from this course. <laughs> okay, so each one, you know, each little section has a little question, quote unquote, you know, like that. Just pick the right one. <coughs> Once you answer everything, you know, at the end of the entire thing, you can click next or you can go to the top where it can give you um, finish attempt and it will ask you to confirm that you are really done. <laughs> Just you know, confirm that. Once you answer all of these questions, you know, to acknowledge that you know what the syllabus is talking about, then you have access to the content of the rest of this class. Okay, so this is just my way of making sure that people, you know, check their syllabus and know where to find the syllabus. Okay, um, would anyone be terribly disappointed if I don't go through the syllabus in detail? No. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> I can probably make a video of just talking about the syllabus for those people who want to get a in-depth discussion, but you can f read it for the most part. I mean, it's all kind of laid out and, and written here. Okay, so just one thing that is important is when our final exam is scheduled, so make sure that you remember that May 15th is a Monday, and our final exam is from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Okay, I cannot tell you how many times I have people, you know, forgetting that the exam, the final exam, is starting at 8 and not 9 a.m. because the lecture starts at 9 a.m. but the final exam starts at 8 a.m. so make sure you remember that part okay so if, some, if no one is going to miss it's going to miss a long discussion of the syllabus you know we lost one day already because of a I don't know whether it's a food poisoning or uh, stomach flu but I got fever muscle ache bone ache headache in addition to stomach ache so it wasn't a very pleasant day for me. Um, I was kind of glad that I took the day off because even, even if I were to come here, you know, it would not be a very good day. <clears throat> All right, so before we move on to actually get into the uh, course content, a few resources that are kind of helpful. Um, this one here, um, you know, on the, if you look at the screen, it's the Android Developer Homepage. If you go there, you know, it will give you a lot of the resources that you need in order to get into Android development okay so this is the top part but if you scroll down it has you know all kinds of links you know, and videos as well to talk about you know how to develop um, apps in Android this class does not talk about iOS okay so if you are trying to get into a class that talked about iOS you know, this is not one of those classes okay so this class is definitely Android specific so this is a good resource. Um, you can watch the videos if you want to. You can also, you know, participate in some of the um, training and also lessons if you want to. Okay. So that's one resource. And this is another resource. I just put this one up um, like a few minutes ago. And it turns out to be a Google Drive with the Debian Live image that I use. Um, because right now what you're seeing on the projector is not Windows. This is Linux. You can do the same thing, okay? So there are a few ways to make use of a Debian Live image, okay? I didn't quite prepare for talking about this part, but that's okay, you know, I, I, I already know how to do it, okay? So you have uh, several ways to do this. The best way, the easiest way, is to burn that image onto a USB thumb drive. Um, you can buy a 416 gig, you know, thumb drive, you know, cheap one, would still be okay, okay? But then you will need a secondary um, external hard drive. I would recommend an external hard drive or an external SSD. Okay, so let me let me just write that down here. Um, 
Well, since I'm doing this, using this resource, I'm gonna do it like this, okay? I've been doing this for some of my classes already. So I'm gonna do it with this class as well, is I'm creating a folder called shared in CISP 363, and the intention is to share this folder with all of you. So all the documents in this folder is automatically available to you while I'm still editing the document, okay? So that's the idea. So let's go to advanced and change the default. It's public on the web, that's fine. It's in view only, okay. There we go. And click done. Copy and paste the link here. So here's another URL that is specific to this class. Shared folder specific to CISP 363. Paste it here. All right, so if you're already in Moodle and you refresh the screen, you should see this you know, shared folder specific to CISP 363. So uh, when you click that, it will bring you to an empty folder because you know, there's nothing in the folder at this point. So what I'll do is I'm gonna create documents as you know, we talk about how to use a live distribution. And I'm gonna rename this to uh, using a live distribution. There we go. All right, so rationale. You know, I, I don't want to do it unless you know I have to okay because this is one of those things where you know why do we have to do this well it has to do with the limitations of the, the way these PCs are set up so these PCs do have Windows already installed um, but there are two things that we have to keep in mind one is it has deep freeze installed as well so every time you reboot the computer um, everything that you install everything they put onto the C drive will disappear Okay, everything that you, that you add to the registry will disappear. Okay, which is which means you know it's not a very good uh, medium for storing your Android projects. Okay, okay, so I'm gonna write it down here. Okay, lab computers have Windows and Deep Freeze installed. Okay. And the second thing is you know at least. Uh, some people have tried it out already. There's no way to install Android Studio in a portable way. In other words, you can install Android Studio on a flash drive, but it's not portable, which means you know you cannot uh, get back to the same settings um, when you run it. Is that about thereabouts. what you meant? <coughs> huh? Yeah, they're about to. It looks like it's installing now, so. Okay. But it just won't re retain certain portions of it. Okay, so Android Studio may not retain settings when you install on an external drive okay so the idea is i want you guys to be able to bring your projects to class okay when we talk about your know, stuff um, in class i want you to be able to bring your hard drive and be able to do all the experiments in class and also your homework too. So during the lab time, you know, I can take a look at your project. When you, if you run into problems, I can take a look. So I want your project to be portable. If you have your laptop computer, you can certainly use a laptop computer if you want to bring your own laptop computer. So that's one easy solution if you have a laptop computer. If you do not want to bring a laptop computer, then you are limited to just a few choices. Okay. So the rationale is, you know, the lab computers have Windows installed and Deep Freeze also installed, which is a problem because now we cannot um, uh, keep the settings, you know, when after you reboot the computer, all the settings are gone. And then as far as, you know, we have tested at this point, Android Studio does not retain the settings when you install it on an external drive. Yep. Why are settings that important? Um, because there are certain things that you want to set up. I'm not really sure you know, how much setting is not retained because the, the project setting should still be associated with the project itself. So it's the other settings that may not be retained. I'm not really sure how much. So you're more than welcome to give it a try. You know, I have not tried it out because I don't use Windows. So for those of you who want to give it a try, you know, we can certainly give it a try. 
But the idea is for you, yeah, go ahead. Is uh, Android Studio installed on this machine? No. No, because it doesn't make sense to have it installed on anything that has Deep Freeze installed. Android Studio updates every week, okay, <laughs> if not more frequently. <laughs> so if it's, deep if, if it's deep frozen, it means it will be running something that is archaic and possibly you know, not supported anymore by the end of the semester. So that's why you know, it doesn't, you know, I can ask them to have Android Studio installed, but since we don't have the cap cap capability to keep it updated all the time, we're just gonna be running behind the curve you know, really soon. Okay. Um, all right, so the live distribution, okay, so live distribution. So the live distribution is basically a way for you to run Linux but without having to install it. All of these computers are set up so they can actually boot from an uh, external USB drive of some kind. And I, my Linux image can boot, it has all the usual tools like a browser and stuff like that. And you can install Android Studio in the persistence part of, which is usually a second drive. And then you can just bring it with you all the time. Um, so that's a possibility. So a live distribution un in under normal use would have would need two devices. Okay, one USB device, small storage by today's standard. Okay, so about four gigabytes is fine for the live image itself. So the live image is really not just Linux, but it also includes you know all kinds of tools. Um, it's the same thing as what I use right here. So if you look under applications um, for, for browsing, we have Firefox already installed, and we have um, LibreOffice installed. We have some development tools involved, you know, but you won't be using these because we have an uh, Android Studio, okay? So already has browser installed and many other useful programs. And then you need another USB device for persistence. Okay. Persistence basically means the, uh, the live image itself is supposed to run from a CD-ROM, which is a read-only media. As a result, you cannot update it. Okay. If you want to store something, if you want to save something, you cannot save onto the first drive. Okay. So you need a second drive for persistence, which is where you store your Android Studio setup and all your projects. Okay. So for the second device, um, you want it to be a, to have a little bit more capacity. Okay. So I would say at least 32 gigabytes because um, personally I have installed Android Studio and it's currently taking up about 21 gigabytes. So I think you know having a minimum of 32 gigabytes for persistence is going to be helpful. Okay. You want it to be relatively fast. Okay, so we'll need to be relatively fast. Um, I would just go for an external hard drive or SSD, uh, single uh, solid state drive. Okay, it doesn't have to be top of the line. You know, there's no need to get a two gig, two terabyte you know hard drive. You know, that's way, way, way too much. Um, if you find like an old laptop computer that has a 300 gigabyte drive, you you can just buy an enclosure for 10 bucks, 15 bucks or so from fries and turn it into your persistence drive. And that's very economical to, because the drive itself is pretty much free, you just need to buy the enclosure to get it done, okay? And that will give you the necessary speed to run um, Android virtual devices, the virtual machines, um, because that's one really great thing about Android Studio is you can debug your programs interactively by using an AVD, so you don't have to use your own Android device to test your applications. Okay, I'll show you guys all of that stuff later. Okay, so this is the the deal: is if you want to use the live distribution, you will need two devices. The first one, you know, I would I would even challenge you know people to find a, a brand new four gigabyte USB thumb drive at Fry's these days. Okay, I think the smallest capacity is well beyond the four gigabytes now. Okay, and this one doesn't have to be fast. Because once Linux is loaded, the applications are running, um, it won't be needing this drive much anymore. Okay? Most of the stuff will be cached in memory. The second device is what needs to be faster you know, for persistence purposes. Okay? 
and I'll give you guys the instruction of how to set this up if that's the route that you want to go. If you say, okay, I have a laptop computer, I will just use the laptop computer, that's fine too, okay? If you have your own laptop computer, it doesn't even matter what operating system it's using because Android Studio is available to Windows, Mac OS X, and also Linux. So your laptop can run any operating system if that's the route that you want to go. Are there any questions at this point about um, the live distribution? Yep, go ahead. Um, are there any uh, performance, I have a pretty old laptop, are there any performance issues that you might see with running Android Studio or emulating on Yeah, a the emulation part is going to be, definitely going to be a problem, but even Android Studio itself um, is can be taxing because you know it's an it's a Java application also, so it can you know take up quite a bit of resources, um, but we don't know until you, we try it. So I would say you know give it a try first. Okay, if it's too slow, then you know, we'll look for some other options. Um, you first, and then you. Okay, What's go ahead. What's the username and password for your live image? It's just user at live. Okay. U S E R and L I V E. Go ahead. I was just going to say for the emulating, are we able to use our, if we have an Android phone? Yeah, you can use an Android, Android phone. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, you can you do it by USB cable, which is probably is the best way to do it in the lab. But when you're home, you can actually use Wi-Fi as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I think, I'm not sure about Bluetooth, but I know for sure that you can do it through Wi-Fi. No, you can't. No Bluetooth? Bluetooth. Okay. It, it technically has support, but it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> That's not work. Okay. Very good. All right. So, are there any questions at this point about you know, the live distribution thing? Okay. So, if you're interested in this approach, we can give it a try on Wednesday. Okay. So, bring you, me your drives, and we'll give it a try. Um, otherwise, if you have a laptop computer, bring your own laptop computer, or you can try to install Android Studio on a thumb drive, and try to use that thumb drive from these PCs running Windows. Okay, so give it a try because you know that's not uh, too difficult to give it a try either. Okay, all right. So there is that. All right, so we are on to the first um, what to call slide or instruction. So I have changed the way I do the instructions now. You know, instead of using. Um, the Moodle document, I'm going to use something that's completely external to Moodle or Canvas or D2L, so this way they can switch uh, LMS again, and I won't be impacted anymore. <laughs> okay. All right, so each module is going to have um, a prerequisite. In other words, if, th if, there's a, if there is a prerequisite, the next one has a prerequisite of this one, actually. Uh, it will give you that link. Okay, so it will give you a link where you can click it and go like, oh, okay, I'm supposed to read that first. Okay, um, and then the objectives is really just what this module is supposed to do. This module introduces Android programming using Android Studio. So this just kind of guides you through the process of downloading, installing Android Studio, and get your first project um, compiled and running inside an AVD or Android virtual device. So this part. You know, just talks about you know how to uh, install Android Studio. Uh, where is that? Hmm? Where is that page that you're looking at? It is the first one under getting started with Java, which is here. Okay. Okay. So it's introduction to Android Studio. So you go to the developer homepage for Android, and then you just you know, click on the link called Get Android Studio and then download it. So let me go there right here. I have um, the page zoomed in, so sometimes it's actually harder to get it right here. So you can see Get Android Studio 2.2, click that. And once you click it, it is aware of the operating system that you're running at this point. So with me, it is asking me to download 2.2.3, which is the current version for Linux. If you do this in Windows, it will give you an executable to install in Windows. The size to download is very misleading. It's only about 0.4, you know, ish, you know, uh, terabyte, no, gigabyte, sorry. 1.4. 1.6. 1.6, Okay. So I don't know why, you know, in Linux the size is a little bit smaller. Um, but once you install it, 
depending on how many components you also want to install, it can take up a lot more space. Okay. So as I said, you know, um, my own personal installation at this point um, is using 21 gigabytes. Okay. So you just have to kind of plan to have more space available to store Android Studio. Any questions about this part? Any questions about where to find um, Android Studio and download it? Okay, once you download, um, in Windows it's easy to install. You just run the executable or the MSI file and it will get it installed. When you install it, you might want to try to install it on the thumb drive or on these computers onto the D drive, which is not a part of the C drive. So this way we can test whether it will work um, when it's on a different drive. Okay. Um, during the lab time, I can actually go through that experiment myself, but right now, since I'm already using Linux and it already has Android Studio installed, um, I cannot test that part at this point. Okay, so we just downloaded Android Studio. So a few notes on installing Android Studio. You know, it can take up quite a bit of space, and you don't need to install Oracle JDK anymore because it is bundling Open JDK version 8 in Android Studio, which is great news, okay? Because before, you would have to install um, Oracle JDK first, otherwise uh, Android Studio doesn't work. Okay. I used to not even work with OpenJDK. It used to crash horribly. Yes. Which is funny. used to have a warning, actually. In fact, you know, Android Studio used to have a warning and say that it does not work you know, with stability if you use OpenJDK, but now that becomes the de facto standard JDK to come with Android Studio. All right. So to run it, uh, this uh, this is actually incorrect. You know, unless you use Linux, it doesn't really matter. Um, there should be a studio dot dat or studio dot something, a shortcut icon. Once you install it in Windows, just double click it. It, will, it should start Android Studio. In Linux, we don't have an icon installed. You know, so I have to run the uh, the shell um, explicitly, the shell program explicitly. The first time you run Android Studio, um, it will ask you to, uh, to get all kinds of updates. You know, that can take a little bit of time. If you are planning to, if you already have an external drive and you want to give it a try today, I would do it in the lab because we do have a lot uh, more bandwidth than most people have at home. Okay. So you can give it a try here. There are many components that you can install, you know, and there, some of these are optional. Uh, the Android SDK or Software Development Kit uh, supports a variety of platforms. <coughs> Each platform is basically a version of Android. So depending on um, what platform, which version of Android your app is going to target, you just have to pick the ones that you want to support and install those. Okay, because it doesn't make any sense to install all 25 platforms. Okay, because that's just going to chew up a lot of space on your drive. In the SDK manager, you can also explore these tabs. I can show you guys, you know, um, you know once I get it running. You can explore these tabs. Uh, you can, there's a, an appearance and behavior system setting and Android SDK. This is the path to get to it. This manager let you select which version of um, Android you want to support and what tools you want to use for development purposes. Um, we can always install additional components later. So if you have any doubt, you don't have to install everything first. You know, when you need it, we can install those. And Android Studio is actually pretty good at figuring out the dependency. So when you try to do something, let's say try to run the program and debug it inside the AVD, it will notice and say that, hey, you haven't installed any Android virtual devices yet, or you don't have images for Android virtual devices, and it will ask you to download and install those at that time. Okay, so you don't have to worry too much about installing too little um, at this point when you first install in, when you first install Android Studio. To start a project, it's really easy. Okay, so I'm going to go through this process here. Um, let me see, where's my Android Studio? This is my Android Studio, it is already started. So I'm gonna close the project. Okay, so this is kind of what you would normally see uh, when you start Android Studio. 
and this is the link that I'm talking about start a new Android studio project okay the first link and when you click it it will ask you to enter you know information that is related to the application that you're gonna uh, develop that you're gonna start the first one is just the application name, which can include you know, space and all kinds of characters. But whatever you type here is going to affect project location directly. Now you can change project location later on, okay, so that it does it can be something that's unrelated to the application name, okay? But when you type your application name, this part will get changed automatically. There's a two here because I got one called my application already. So this is the second project with the same name, so that's why when we get to the folder or the location, it has a two after the name, okay? So instead of using that name, I can say uh, test application, and you can see you know, if, when I change the name to test application, um, the project location is just test application without the two, okay? As I said, you can always change this name explicitly so that it can be something, you know, something that you want to use, okay? The second one is called company domain, which is an identification uh, to specify the name of your Java packages, okay? So this is kind of not important as far as we are concerned, you know, for uh, educational purposes, but when you are about to actually write some real commercial you know, apps, you might want to make sure that you use or register a particular domain and then use that domain you know, as your company domain, okay? So in this case, you know, I can certainly use my you know, student ID uh, .apps.losrios.edu. It doesn't really matter, okay? It doesn't really have any bearing at this point, okay? So as long as it is unique to you, it's good. All right. Um, I have not even tried to include C++ you know, support. I don't think it is relevant as far as we are concerned at this point. All right, so that part is done. Click Next. Now this is the fun part because this part allows you to select what version of Android do you want to support? Okay. And unlike previous versions of Android Studio or um, Eclipse, this one actually has a pretty good tool to help you choose. Okay, it's actually very graphical. Let me click it. So when I click Help Me Choose, it shows you a diagram of the market share of, ver of different versions of Android. So in this chart, you can clearly see that KitKat is the majority, okay? Because it occupies about, what, 33.4% of all the Android devices out there. Just that one version, okay? Just KitKat version 4.4 of Android is the majority of all the different versions, okay? So when you want to choose you know, what, um, which platform you want to support, Android is always upward compatible. In other words, if you choose to support uh, version 4.4, it will automatically support 5.0, 5 5.1, 5 and 6.0, and all the later versions, okay? Is that okay so far? But there are reasons why you may not want to go all the way back to gingerbread, because all these versions of Android, they all add some features. Okay, so depending on what features your app needs, you might have a minimum set of features where, okay, I cannot go you know, any earlier than, let's say version 4.4, because there's some feature in 4.4 that is essential to the app that I'm developing. Okay, so this is where you know, it, it's very handy to just click on these different versions, because when you click on different versions, um, they give you a summary, okay? So it can tell you, um, what is special about this version. So with version 4.0, with contact provider, they have social API, user profile, invite intent, large photo, and calendar provider has the calendar APIs and so on. When you look at Lollipop, you know, version 5.0, um, you can see that in media, they have camera API for advanced camera capability, audio playback, and so on and so forth, okay? so. Um, 
for the first part of this semester, I don't think this will matter much to us. Okay, so you know, we can pretty much pick any version we want. But and then, but later on, you know, as you have more idea of what you want to do with your application, you can go through all of this stuff here and go like, okay, I think I need at least you know, this version and up. Okay, right. So let's click OK here. Switch back to here, and obviously you can also you know, just select the version here. So you can go back to an earlier version. So I can say KitKat. And each version, you know, there are several names to each version. Let me um, click this part again. Okay. So the Android version, like 2.3, 4.0, 4.1, 4.2, those are available, those are visible to uh, consumers. Okay, so when you tell when you when consumers ask, okay, what is the version of Android that is um, installed on this device, that's the version number. Okay. The name of the platform, which is always based on um, something that's sugary, that's just a common name, okay? Gingerbread, jelly bean, and so on. But it's not unique, okay? Because you can see 4.1 is jelly bean, 4.2 is jelly bean, 4.3 is also jelly bean, and then KitKat is 4.4, okay? So that's co that code name is mostly, I think it's mostly for marketing purposes more so than you know, for people to distinguish which version of Android that you have. For developers, it makes even more sense to talk about the API level because that one is certainly unique. So we have version API level 10 for version 2.3, uh, API level 15 for version 4.0, and so on. And this one is always an integer. There are no decimal values, okay? The current version, by the way, is 25. Okay, it's 25 at this point, so it's not even in this chart because the uh, cumulative distribution for the latest version of Android, which is also 7.1.1, is very few. Okay, very few devices have the latest version of Android or API level 25 installed, so most people would not target that particular platform when they're writing apps. Because otherwise, you can only have a very small portion of Android devices to make use of your app. Any questions about these things? No questions? Okay. All right. So I'm going to click OK, close this window. Okay, so I'm just going to pick 4.4 um, here. And at this point, I'm not interested to teach you know, how to deal with Android Wear, you know, smartwatches. TV, uh, Android Auto, or Glass. Okay, so all of these things, you know, we can play with it maybe at some point, uh, but not right away. So click Next. Now that we have selected the minimum SDK, and the next one is to add an activity to mobile. Okay, now the term activity is special. It has a very specific meaning in Android app development. The term activity is kind of like a screen, but it's not exactly a screen, okay? If you're coming from App uh, Inventor, from CISB 362, the sc a screen in App Inventor is kind of an activity in Android development, okay? So for the most part, you can look at an activity as quote unquote a screen, okay? So right now, it, you can choose you know, your app to have no activity to start with. In other words, your app has no screen to begin to start with. A basic one, an empty one, full screen, which means you know, you're going to hide um, the status bar and also the, the buttons down at the bottom, and so on. So I'm going to pick you know, just empty activity, just following my own notes. So I'm going to pick empty activity, click next. And this on this tab, you can choose the name of the activity. Now, this is also where you know we start to use you know camel casing, which is basically you know you cannot have a space in the activity name. Um, it has to start well. It should start with an uppercase, um, and then you know with each word, uh, the beginning of each word inside the activity name should also be uppercase. This is called camel casing. Um, the reason why it's uppercase to begin with is because it is the name of a class. And by convention, okay, this is not required by the compiler, but by convention, C++ and Java would like to use uppercase letter to begin the name of a class. So this is by convention. 
So this is going to be important because it is actually a class that we're going to deal with. And then the second one is a uh, layout <clears throat> or the name of the layout. A layout is kind of the design of a particular screen. We'll see that you know, in just a moment. Um, you can give it a different name if you want to, but since we only have one activity you know, for demonstration purposes, it really doesn't matter how you want to name it. And the name of the activity does not start with the uppercase letter. For now, I'm just going to take all the defaults. I'm not going to change it. Okay. All right, so once we are done with this, we click Finish. And depending on the speed of your computer and also your external drive, uh, this may take a little bit of time. But on these computers, you know, they're pretty much your know, brand spanking new. Um, I don't know what processor they have, but it's really fast, you know, much faster than my laptop computer at home. All right, so we have now, you know, our app here. This is your app inventor screen, which is surprisingly not too busy. Okay, you know, this is actually not very busy at all compared to many other applications. You have your typical title bar, okay, so the title bar is right here, and then your menu bar here, okay, so nothing really surprising here. And then you have your toolbar. This bar is kind of interesting. This bar is kind of a navigation bar so that you can navigate to different components depending on uh, where you want to go. When you click on the left part, which is higher up in the hierarchy of the application, you can see that it will give you various options. Okay? For the most part in this class, we're going to be, we'll mostly be concerned about the app portion of an app. And then in app, you can look at little source. There we go. And inside source, we have main. And inside main, we have you know, Java, which are the source code in Java, as well as RES, which are the resources. So we can pick, you know, well, let's go ahead and pick resource this time. So after we pick resource, we can pick out layout. And layout has only one component, so it doesn't give us you know, choices anymore. So at this point, if I click on this, it will show us the layout. <clears throat> and it will open up the layout editor for us as well. So when you look at this screen, okay, let me just kind of change the proportions a little bit, just like that. This should remind you of um, one of the screens in App Inventor, for those of you who took CISD 362, because the leftmost portion, uh, we don't call these components, we call these widgets, okay? But nonetheless, you know, they are kind of the same thing. They give you, this, is, this will give you a lot more options compared to App Inventor. But basically, you can have buttons, text view, check boxes, and so on and so forth. But the list, oops. The list goes on and on and on. Okay, so you can have you know, different types of text fields you know, to deal with passwords, plain text, time, date, and so on. You can have different types of layout, grid type, frame type. So these are kind of um, like arrangements in App Inventor. But in App Inventor, we only got three arrangements. We have horizontal arrangement, vertical arrangement, and table arrangement. But in Android Studio, it gives you a gazillion ways to do layout, okay? So, a lot more options. So we're not gonna do, go, go too crazy here. This is a preview screen of the layout. So you, know, if you can always zoom in and take a look at what your application looked like at this point for a particular resolution. So this is a typical phone, app, uh, phone <coughs> excuse me, resolution. So you can see that the app you know, has a label. Okay? You can click on the label, just like in App Inventor 2.0, when you click on a component, or when you click on the widget in this case, inside the layout editor, it will bring up the property of that particular component. Okay? So you can see that in this case, it has no ID. Okay? So hello world as a text view has no ID, which basically means there's no easy way to find it and program and change it in your code, okay? Which is okay, you know, this is not what we are gonna, what we are doing in the first app. You can change the properties. So you can uh, make it, make the width match the parent, which is basically 100% of the parent in App Inventor. Uh, you can also do the same thing with height, so that it is the same height as the parent. The parent is basically what is containing this particular text view 
In this case, it will be the entire screen, this portion here. Okay? The initial text property is hello world. Obviously, you can change that. Okay? And this one is code completion available. Oh, I guess it's hmm. not exactly sure what that is for. Content description, you know, it, this is for um, when you hover over the pointer, you know, it will describe what it, what it is. And this is only a summary of all the properties. If you want to look at all of the, all of the properties, you can click view all properties and it'll give you <coughs> everything, including the kitchen sink. <laughs> Because this is not just things that are specific to a text view. This, these are things that are available through the entire inheritance hierarchy. Okay, because a text view is a subclass of something, which is, is probably just a view, and then the view is a subclass of something else. This gives you everything. Okay. All right. But we are not too concerned about all of these things for this particular app for testing purposes because I just want to run it. I just want to test run this particular app and see you know, okay, how difficult is it to run this app here. So we'll go ahead and click the run button and it'll go through whatever is necessary to um, run it. So the only device that I have is a Nexus 5 with API 23, which is a later version of Android. It's okay because remember, if your app is compiled for an earlier API, it will always run in a later API. Okay? It may not look right because you know, it may not look modern with all the nice cool features of a later version of Android, but it will run. Okay? So this is okay. I can run this app in this particular AVD. AVD stands for Android Virtual Device. So I pick out this one. If I want to create new ones, I can just click Create New Virtual Device. Um, I'll just go ahead and click it, okay, just so that you can see you know, what it looks like, you know, but to create a new Android uh, virtual device. Since we're dealing with phones, smaller devices, it has everything, you know, all the Nexus, because these are all Google devices, so they, they're all available here. The screen size are actual sizes, okay, so these are the actual sizes of those particular devices. You can also have, you know, some, you know, other type of devices with different screens, Nexus S, Nexus One, Slider, and so on. So I typically just go for something that's kind of common, like Nexus 5 is really common. Uh, Nexus 4 are even more common, but it's an older device. And you know, when you um, click Next, it will go through, it will install whatever component is necessary to get it working. Right. So getting back to here, I just click OK because this is what I want to run. It also knows that I have no USB devices or running emulator detected, which is great. Okay, Because if I do have a USB cable with a phone with developer options turned on, it will find it here. It will be like, OK, do you want to test your application using this device that is connected by USB or do you want to start an Android virtual device? <clears throat> So here's my Android virtual device. This part runs a lot faster if your processor, if your native processor in the PC has virtualization acceleration. Um, this particular computer is super fast. I mean, look at this. This is much faster than my actual like, Nexus 5. My actual Nexus 5 would take, I don't know, maybe a minute or two to boot up to the screen. It took only about 15 seconds, okay? So this is a lot faster than uh, usual. Okay. Instant requires that the platform corresponding to your target device, Marshmallow. Oh, okay. Proceed without instant run, install and continue. Okay. So it, as I said a little bit earlier, it will detect what you need and help you, you know, identify what needs to be installed in order to uh, get it to work. So there we go, finish. Try and tell it never mind, it won't work. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna close this and let's run it again. Ah, okay, unexpected error because I just I closed it. <laughs> error while launching activity. Okay, let's do it one more time. One more time.
I'm really sad to see a uh, cyanogen mod to go away, but now it has a new name. It's um, Lin, Lin something. Yeah, Lin. It's it's the, it's essentially cyanogen mod. They yep. lost the rights to the name, basically, is the short story. Yeah, I, I, I got that article still. earlier today. You know, it basically is the same thing. They're already supporting 80 devices. Yeah. Yep. All right, so we see the application running here. Okay, it says, you know, hello world. Doesn't do anything, has no interaction capability because I did not program anything in for interaction. But this is how the development process works, okay? From the creation of the app, all the way to running it inside a virtual device. All right, are there any questions about this entire chain of um, instructions? No questions? Okay. All right, so if there are no questions, I'm going to move on and talk about some actual programming because I think you guys are not are kind of, if this is all we're going to do, it's not very exciting, is it? Okay, so we're going to start some actual programming in Java. Okay, some basic stuff, not terribly exciting either, but it will start to have some interaction. So I'm, what I'll do is I'm going to including I'm going to include a button. Okay, so here's a button, and you can also drag the button you know, to relocate it. And this is the button you know with all the properties. And I'm going to hide this part here because you know I don't really need part to show up like that and how do I show fewer properties now the button does have an ID okay so the button has an ID and I want to add an ID to the text view as well because I if you don't have a um, if you don't have an ID you cannot get to it okay so if it is something that you want to change or manipulate later on you want it to be to have an ID the button has an ID, uh, the text view does not have an ID, so I'm going to just add an uh, ID here. So we'll just say, um, hello, I, hello label, okay, there we go. And you can name it anything you want, you know, as long as it is a uh, valid variable name, it will work here. Yep. Does not having an ID mean it's just an anonymous instantiation, is that how it works? Um, they are all anonymous. It's just that with an ID, you can look it up in the resources, so it will have an integer constant associated with it. I'll, I'll show you guys exactly what I mean by that, okay? All right, so now both components have um, an ID, and I want to change the button, okay? It's just so that it reads something a little bit more interesting. So I just say, click me, click me, there we go. And this is just the text appearing on the button itself, so you can have anything you want. Okay, exclamation points, doesn't really matter. And I think you can change the font as well, because right now it's using um, all caps as a font. But I think you can change that. <coughs> you can change the style, you can change a lot of things. Okay, but I'm not too concerned about all of that, because I want to look at the programming side of this stuff here, and say, okay, how do I you know, write the code to link to the button so that when the button is clicked, it will change the text to something else. That's all I wanted to do, okay? All right, so now the layout is done, okay? I got everything that I need in the layout, so I want to go back to the app itself in Java code. So I go to app, I go back to source, go to main this time, and then go to Java. Last time I went to resource, this time I have to go to Java, which is basically the source code portion of your program, and it only has one, which is main activity. So there we go. So now we have, this is automatically generated by Android Studio. I did not write a single line of code here, but it doesn't hurt to explain what we are currently seeing before we start to extend this code a little bit more. Okay, so you can see that um, Android Studio, like most IDEs, uh, support you know the hiding of details. In other words, most of the time, you don't really need to know what it is importing. But if you do want to know what it's importing, you can click on the little plus sign here so it expands what type of packages or, or what type of class definitions it is importing. So right now, we know that it's importing um, app compatibility compat activity to make this activity backward compatible to even older devices. It also in uh, importing bundle. The reason why it's importing these two things is because this class 
is the base class of main activity. So we need to know what this class, how this class is defined. And then bundle is used over here as an argument to on create. Okay? But on create is done automatically. I did not write this uh, method, which is basically a function inside the class definition. Is, is that okay? I mean, does everybody understand these terms? The term of, cl of class, inheritance, method, argument. Is that okay? Okay, anytime you have any questions about that part, just kind of let me know and I can stop and explain those concepts. Okay. Now this part here, I can use a little bit of explanation already. So right here we can see at override. Okay, at override is not needed. In other words, if I take out this you know, at override here, the program would still compile. It's just not a good idea. Okay? The reason why it has override is because we are overriding the onCreate method that is already implemented by the superclass. Can someone tell me which one is the superclass? We only got two classes here. Which one is the superclass? Uh, app Compact Activity. Yep, App Compact Activity is the superclass and we are main activity is inheriting from that superclass. The superclass already has its own onCreate which performs a variety of operations as a, an activity is created, which is great, okay? We want to keep those things, okay? So that's why the first line of this subroutine is to say, oh, whatever the superclass has already specified to do with onCreate, let's do that first. So we don't lose the um, whatever functionality onCreate had with a superclass by, you know, uh, by overriding it <coughs> in a subclass, okay? So we, are, we, we basically say, keep all that good stuff that we have been doing with the superclass, but in addition to that, we got one more thing to do, okay? The one more thing to do is to set content view using the layout activity main. In other words, this call here, the call to set content view is what makes your activity look the way it is supposed to, with a label and also a button. Okay, this is where you know, all the components are created on this activity. You can take it out if you want to. Okay, you can comment this out and see what happens to your app. The screen will still be created, but there won't be any text uh, label on it. There won't be any buttons on it because it doesn't know to make use of the layout. Okay, if you have any variables, you know that is uh, specific to this activity. This may be a good time to initialize some of those variables as well. Yep. So the layout has been the button and the hello world has added to the layout. Yes. The layout is an XML? Uh, the layout can be seen as an XML file, yes. Right. So the layout is, is a great tool. You don't have to use a layout to create you know, buttons and text views and stuff like that. You can always create those on the fly when your program is running. But the layout gives you the control over the locations, and it gives you the WYSIWYG editor, which makes it very easy to place components. Okay, very good. All right. But I want the button to respond to something. I want to be able to program what the button is going to do when I click it. Okay, so let's check out how we can do that. And by the way, you know, my second note uh, already has a full description of what I'm about to do. So if you go to the next item, which is a structure of a simple Android app. Okay, so I'm going to open this in a new tab just so they can see both. So this one has a prerequisite of um, 0253, which is the other one. So you need to have Android Studio installed before you read this one. But it has a, an app already installed or an app already uh, available for download. So you can download this app. Um, this is a full folder in Android Studio. Once you unzip this, you can go to Android Studio and just say, okay, open a, an existing project. You can direct Android Studio to go to the folder that you just unzip into, and it will basically load this project normally. Okay, this is, this is great, okay? Um, I could not believe myself that this is not butter. <laughs> no, I cannot believe how easy it is to just you know point Android Studio to a folder 
and say, hey, open that as an Android Studio project. And it open it with no problems whatsoever. So that makes grading a whole lot easier, too. Yep. It has something to do with the Gradle, though, right? Hmm? It has something to do with the Gradle. Hi, um, yes. But yeah. I, Gradle, I have, um, before I was, uh, I was really worried that there will be something that won't work out, you know, if I don't, if, if I just, you know, unzip a folder and try to open it. Um, and I read some articles on, you know, how to import and export Android Studio projects, and it's horrendous. But apparently, those articles only apply to earlier versions of Android Studio. So when I tried it with the latest version, it, it went without a hitch. It was, it was really easy. Okay? So I can show you guys you know, this too you know, later on. Okay? All right, so let's go back to our uh, app here. So I need to go back to the layout to do one thing. Okay, so let me go, go back to the layout first. So the layout, you know, I have to go back to main, go to resource, go to layout, and there's one thing I need to do with the button. Okay, so the button is now um, selected. I'm looking at the properties of the buttons or some of the properties. There's only one that I need to make sure that it has, which is on click here. Okay, so on click, once if you want to, if you want the button to do something, on click this property on click is the name of a method that is in the act, the class corresponding to the activity. Okay, so let me say that one more time. Okay, this is a property of the button, but it corresponds to the name of a method of the activity that is including this button. So in our case. The activity class is called main activity. So this name corresponds to a method that should be defined in main activity as a class. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and give it a button, a name, okay? Um, we'll just say update label. Okay. So that's the name of the subroutine or method that I want to name, you know, to update the label. But this won't create the method for you, okay? It's just a name. So at this point, I can switch back to the Java code. Okay? And in the Java code, it doesn't do a single thing, okay? It doesn't really have anything corresponding to it. But I can um, just uh, type that name, which is update label. And does it know what to do with it? You, type. sorry. Need return type. Yeah, it wants to know the return type. I think it's just a void because it's an event handler. And you may have to do public void as well as what's set in the little tooltip. Yeah, I, I'm just trying out to see how far it can go by. I think it also needs a, an argument as well. The argument is the thing that is creating it, which is a view. So view. OK, so this is, this is really cool. Because I know the argument has to, uh, has to be of the type or the class view. And Android Studio is smart enough to go like, hey, I might know the view that you are referring to. Did you mean to uh, include? Uh, Android.view, lowercase, dot view, uppercase. Because, okay, this is how you read a type of, this is how you read a package. The first part, the parts where everything is lowercase, those are, uh, those are parts of a package path. The last one, which is uh, uppercase V, that is the name of the class of this particular package. So we're dealing, we're talking about the Android.view package. But inside the package, we're talking about a particular class, which is uppercase V view. Okay. So if this is, in fact, you know, the view that I want to use, I can now type control enter, and it will include that in the import here. This is really handy, because a lot of times, you, re you may remember the name of the class that you want, but you don't remember the exact package, which, you, which is what you need for the import statement to work. So this is great because there are only a few occasions where um, it's the same class name, but the package path is different. 
There are only very few cases like that. So for the most part, you know, this will resolve all of that stuff. Okay. Okay, so now that we have a you know subroutine to update the label, we can now specify some code here. The first thing we need to do is to say, oh, uh, this is going to get called whenever the button is clicked. Okay, but the question is, I want to update the text of the label, so I need to know, hey, which label are we talking about, right? So we're going to create a um, text view. Is the name of the it is the type of the label. Android doesn't really differentiate between a text box versus a label. They're pre they're pretty much the same thing. They're all they're both called the text view. So in this case, you know, this text view is what we want. But since it's in red, it means we have a problem. So when you okay, it actually offered to include. Okay, you can now see your text view is also imported. Okay, because you know, it, it trust me, without this feature, you'll be spending a lot of time on the browser just to find out, okay, what is the package including this particular class? Okay, this you will still be using a browser a lot, you know, as you do programming in Android, you know, that's just no getting around that part. But this really helps a lot in terms of um, not having to deal with all these you know, little details you know, by yourself. Okay, so this is going to be a V, you know, as a variable. Now, this is important. If you come from a C++ background, and this is the first time you write a you know, program in Java, V is a reference. Okay, V is not actually an object. It is a reference to a text view. Okay, a reference is not quite the same thing as a pointer, but it's pretty close. Okay, so V is not instantiated. It's not uh, a particular text view, it is just a reference or a pointer to a text view. So what we need to do now is to say, okay, v equals to, and then we use you know, a cast here, and we want to look it up, and of course I cannot remember the name of the function, so I'm going to cheat and look at my own notes here. Right here, find view by id, okay, there we go. Find view by ID. Now, find view by ID is a method um, that is inherited through the activities. And this is why we associated an ID with the text view, because without that, we won't be able to refer to the text view that we want to ma manipulate. Okay. And the argument to this is an integer. Well, what integer are we talking about? Now, there's a special uh, class called R, uppercase R, and I know this is a class because it starts with an uppercase. Okay, so R is a very special case, very special class, because it is defined so that we have access to all the resources. So when you say R, then it's, it's a class. R.ID is a class as well. Okay, so within R.ID, you can see all of the IDs that we have defined including the layout itself, which is activity underscore main, and also the ID of the various items. And you can definitely see hello label is one of them. Okay, And hello label is the ID of the text view that we want. So we have hello label here. Okay, And this concludes this function. But it really is tricky. This looks simple, but it really is a lot trickier than it seems because when you look at the prototype of find view by ID, it does not re return a text view. Can someone uh, tell me what type it is supposed to return? Just by the name of the method, what is the type that it returns? Not supposed to return anything. Well, it returns a view. It returns a reference yeah. to a view, and text view is a subclass of a view. So this is actually downcasting. For those of you who still remember something from CISP 400 or 401, it is called downcasting. Because what find view by ID is returning is a reference to a super class. But I am so confident that <laughs> that thing is actually a text view, which is a subclass of a view. I'm saying, oh, let's downcast it, okay? 
Now, downcasting is can be dangerous. Okay, depending on the implementation, because what if this is not a text view? What if it is a button, which is also a view? Okay, everything is a view. A button is a view. A text box is a view. A scroll bar is a view. Okay, an image is a view. Okay, so all of those are views, but they are not text views. So if if find view by ID, okay, if I supply button here instead of hello label, it's going to return a button, right? Which is a subclass of a view. But when I try to downcast into a text view, we'll end up with a runtime error. Okay, so this is a little bit dangerous. If you are one of those people who go like, well, I, I really want to make sure that we can downcast before downcasting. If we, I cannot actually downcast, I want to print an error message. There are ways to check first, okay, to see whether it, can, it is downcastable to a text view before you actually perform the downcast. Okay? I cannot remember the syntax, but I'm <laughs> pretty sure it can be done. Okay? Because in C++, you know, there is a way to do it too. Yep. Why do you have in in the declaration of uh, view x, but then you use uh, b as the letter? Why do I have here? Yeah, b there, and then x in the pre the one line up. That's a w. Uh, that's an x. Yeah, it's an argument for long b. Uh, right, that's the argument of the event handler. In other words, this x here is the component that is receiving the event. Gotcha. In this case, it would be the button. So I should be able to down, downcast x to a button in order to access the properties of that button. Gotcha. The v is basically something else. Okay, th In this case, it's the label that I want to change. Gotcha. So, so the x tells you where the, the event right. came from. Yep. So you can use that if you want to know what view. Yep, because you can have like two buttons having the same event handler. So you, it might be helpful to find out, okay, which button is clicked to get me here. It depends on your program, but it does give you a way to track back and say, okay, how did we get here? In other words, which component received an event so that we ended up here? Okay. And I'm pretty sure the public is not needed, so I'm gonna get rid of public here, okay. We go. All right. So we only got one more thing to do, which is you know making use of v. V is a text view. So now we can go through all the stuff that we can do with text view, and what we really want to do is to change the text. So we can go through this list here. I think it's always going to be a set function, set method. So scroll, scroll, scroll. Oh well, I can always just type set text. Okay, yeah, that's pretty easy. So you would, who would imagine that set, set text has so many methods corresponding to it, right? Okay, what about the integer? We, uh, it doesn't seem to make sense that we'll use an integer to specify text, but it does. Because with Android programming, your resource can include text as a resource. And in that resource, every single string has an ID that is just an integer. It makes it easier to port your application to different languages, to localize your app to various languages. Okay? So the use of literal string, which is what I'm using here, is really not a very good approach. Because you know, it, it, once I do this, then I have you know, text scattered all over the place. It becomes much more difficult to uh, localize the app to different languages. Okay? But that's not the focus today, so that's why I'm just going to go for the easiest way to do it. Okay? So set text, I can just use the string approach. Okay, the so string approach is easy. You just go like you know, double quote, okay, and say hello there, hello there. Okay, there we go, and then put a semicolon here. You know, I'm not sure whether you guys can see it on the projector. There's a little squiggly red line here to say that it's you know the syntax is not quite right. So there we go, we got everything here. All right, so let's go ahead and test this program again, okay, because now it is supposed to be able to respond to the click of the button. So there we go, and look at the app. The app is actually already running, but when you recompile and run it again, it will update 
the app. So let me go back here, just click it one more time. Oops, there we go. So now we have click me, you know, as a button, click it, and it changes the text to hello there. So the program, you know, works. You know, it's it's not really a useful application, but it shows the most basic elements of okay, how do I make this program interactive? How do I make a button something that's interactive and respond to events to those things? Okay, I know this app is currently not you know very useful, but you know it does show you the framework of how to make it useful. Definitely won't get you the top developer star in the Google Play Marketplace. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so getting back to the screen here, this is one thing that I haven't shown or you know have not really uh, included in the text. On this bar here, you can actually uh, put breakpoints. Okay, just click here on each line. You know, just click on this bar. And when you see a red symbol, it is a breakpoint, which means when execution gets here, stop. Okay. Now this is one of the best feature of a debugger, is to be able to stop the program on particular lines and investigate. Okay, what is you know available at that point? You can say, okay, tell me what is V at this point. Okay. So I can put this over here, and just run the program again. Debug app. So we start. There you go. And I'll click it. And now execution has gone to the debug point. It has currently stopped. So when you look at the app here, it hasn't really changed the text because it is about to change the text. But at this point, we can also investigate what is V. So let me see whether we can right click and evaluate. That's not how it works. So we can go to Tools, New. No. Okay, we are already debugging. We can step over, which will update the text. We want to evaluate expression, there we go. So we want to evaluate expression, and V by itself is an expression. So we can just type V and say evaluate. And this is V. In other words, V is now a reference to an actual text view, and these are the properties of that particular text view. <coughs> Which obviously is a lot of stuff, right? But the point is, you know, with the ABD or with a debugger running, you can stop the program at breakpoints and be able to look into the variables, expressions, and whatnot, and say, okay, tell me what is this variable right now at this point. And that's a great tool for debugging. Uh, when I was teaching CISP 362, you know, the, the, the ability of having a debugger was sorely missed. <laughs> because if you cannot debug an application by setting breakpoints and stuff like that, it just makes it a lot harder to debug. You need notifiers left and right to print something on the screen, you know, update the color of something just to know, okay, I got here. This is much better. Okay, so I want you guys to kind of use it as a habit. Okay, you know, try to use the debugger as much as you can when you're trying to debug your app. All right, so. We are running out of time for the lecture. You do have a homework assignment. Okay. Already? Yeah. <laughs> we missed one day already, so we have to kind of catch up. So your homework assignment is right here. It's called create your first project and turn it in. So what you're going to do is go through pretty much the same process that I went through today, except in your app, you have two buttons instead of one. You will, still, you will also have one text. Uh, uh, text view, but you have two buttons. Uh, one button is labeled blah, and the other one is uh, labeled yada. Okay. <laughs> really not Yoda. Depend, huh? Really not Yoda. Not Yoda. <laughs> Yoda talk is um, is postfix, right? So anyway, so when what when when button is clicked, uh, the text area should display hello exclamation point, 
when the other one is clicked, um, the text area should switch to by exclamation point. So it's a very simple extension to what I have just done in today's class. You just add one more button, change the labeling of the button, and change the text accordingly. Okay. You probably want to have two event handlers, okay, because that makes it a lot easier to deal with. Um, if you only have one, then you have to differentiate which button is the one, the one responsible for the event. You can do it that way, but it's a lot more work than it needs to be. Having two event handlers, you know, just makes it so much easier to deal with. But it's up to you, okay? If you want to take on a challenge, use one single event handler. If you, you know, just want to get it done, use two, okay? So the key is when you're done, you want to locate the project folder and zip the entire folder. Okay, not the content, but zip the folder itself. So in Windows, what it means is to right-click the folder itself and then use send to um, and to create your zip file. Do not give me any other format. Okay, you know, zip file is the only one that I want. Okay, I can show you in Linux what it looks like. You know, in terms of folders. So um, no tar .gz. huh? No tar .gz. No tar .gz. Yep, because I know in Windows it's kind of hard for you guys to get a tool to do tar. You have to use get 7z, you know, to get it easily. Okay, so the folder is Android Studio Projects. Okay, so that's the folder where your projects are normally included. So if you click that, you will see, you know, the projects. Okay, the one that I just worked on is test application. So I would do this. Okay, if I were you, you're done with your homework. I would close the project first. So I would go to the project itself and close it. Okay, do you want to disconnect from the process app? Yep, go ahead and disconnect. Make sure this is not showing any project. Then you go back to your file manager and then right click on the folder that you want to zip. And you know, I don't do it the same way over here, but in Windows, you know, when you say send to, one of the options is going to be a zip file. So this is how you're going to create the zip file with the same name as the folder itself. So don't change that part. And then just turn in your zip file, that's all I need. So are there any questions about what homework you need to do and what you, what you need to do in the homework? You have one week to work on it and you can do it in the next uh, hour or so, you know, during the lab time. So if you run into problems, you know, I can help you with that. Uh, some of you have a laptop computer with you, so you can just go ahead and install uh, Android Studio and get, work, get started. Uh, if you don't have anything that you can use to get started, you can give it a try, give Windows a try first. It, it, it's running, you just can't do virtualization on it. Okay. If you have a device and you can plug it in, that works. Okay, great. I'm actually doing that right now. Okay, excellent. Okay, so that's good, you know, so you can actually go ahead and get started with it. Um, even if you don't have your own device, you know, just use the D drive. Did you install it on the D drive? Android Studio. You installed it on the C drive? Yeah, I installed it on the okay. C. Okay. If you installed it on the D drive, it will still be there when you reboot the computer. What do you use for admin permissions to that? As long as you download the zip, not the exe. Oh. Um, so it'll unzip it'll, to a folder? It will unzip and then it just runs. Mm -hmm. The only part it complains about, and this is you need it for the virtual, I is see. Uh, Helmex or something like that. Okay. All right, so let me... Let me check that part. Android Studio download option. Okay. So I'll read the doc. Download options. There we go. So in Windows, you can download it as executable or a zip file. So this is what you're talking about, right? Yeah, you download that one and it'll pull in the SDK afterwards. Okay. And you can unzip the zip file to any folder. Yeah. So that's the beauty of this approach. Okay, cool. So I would give this a try and do it on an external you know, thumb drive. If it works, it's great. If it doesn't work, then we'll figure out something else for the class. All right. Any questions? All right. Well, this is going to be the end of today's lecture. I am going to take a short break. And then at about 10.30, I'll be back here. Uh, if you want to do your homework, you know, the lab time, go ahead. Um, if you got something else to do, you know, that's okay too.
Did you want to take roll? Or? Oh, that's right. Roll shoot. That's right. Keep forgetting the roll shoot. I cannot tell you how many times I have forgotten already this semester. Like twice. <laughs> Don't worry, we won't tell. We only, I only have two classes. Forgetting twice out of two classes is 100%. 100% failure rates. Forgetting? These computers do not let you log. That's weird. Oh, here it is. Now that's sign out. No? I cannot lock the computer.